In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, First of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two co copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So you have many goods laid up for you for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will these things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life which you will eat, nor about the body which you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a stature? If then you are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O, little, o of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor be have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will, will be also. Amen. After he rebuked the scribes and Pharisees in an intense way for their hypocrisy and cunningness for their works, now God is speaking to the disciples while an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together around him. And it is Unbelievable how innumerable multitudes of people gathered to hear nothing more than the words of God. The words that came forth from the mouth of Jesus Christ. They came to listen to nothing more. 
And this, my beloved brethren, shows the error, let us not use another expression, the, the, the error of people who try to draw people near with different human need, means. They try to uh, bring people close to them with uh, organs, with music, with, uh, with shows. And even if this does happen, that someone will come, it will have no good result in his life. What draws the soul of man is the Word of God, because the Word of God is the food of the soul. Man will not live, leave, live with bread alone, but with every mouth that comes forth from the mouth of God, Christ said. So when the soul is hungry to hear the truth, to hear words of comfort, words of support, words that are admonishing even, when this soul is hungry to receive the food that is appointed for the soul of man, then man will come. But, if man does not care about the word of God at all, if he doesn't care about everlasting life, if he doesn't care about the food of his soul, then, and he has appointed a different food for his soul, uh, having fun, uh, sin, the abundance of sin, then he won't come either way. So what matters in the kingdom of heaven, in the word of God, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, is for God to lure man, the hungry and thirsty man for the word of God, to draw him near to Jesus Christ, to reveal Jesus Christ to him. And for that reason, Jesus Christ is blunt. And he says, no one comes to me if my father doesn't lure him, doesn't draw him. No matter how many attempts we people may make, and that is good for us not to do such things. And the only attempt that we must do is to encourage our Father to draw people, to pray to Him so God can draw people close to Him so He can save them, even us. So an innumerable multitude of people came toward Christ, toward the Word of God, but our Lord spoke to His disciples. You know, the work of Christ is main, mainly a training work. He trains man. He teaches him. And for that reason, the Christians were named Christians after they had first been named disciples. The Church of Christ is formulated of disciples. It's not made of uh, teachers or professors. There is one teacher, and that is Christ. <laughs> and one is our guide, and that is Christ. And for that reason, the Church of Christ has no rulers. It has no lords. It has no masters. It has no people who go before it. The Church of Jesus Christ has servants. Joint servants. Fellow servants. And all together, we all together care about the Word of God, the words of Christ, and the doctrine of the Apostles. And now Jesus Christ speaks to these disciples, the ones who have an appetite and a, and a desire to learn, to be taught, and to be admonished, and be led by the Word of God. And He is absolute and catalytic, I'd say, when He says, Only whoever is led by the Holy Spirit is a child of God. Only they. And of course, we have to know well if we are led or not. Because if we are not governed by the Holy Spirit and we think that we are governed, we will, be we will find ourselves before surprises. And the man who is governed, the Christian who is governed by the Holy Spirit and he is a child of God, you can tell if this happens by his fruit. Christ says there is no tree that can produce good fruit in it to be a bad tree. And there is no way that a good tree, good tree will produce bad fruit. From the tree you can tell, from the fruit you can tell the tree. So for that reason you must be careful of the false prophets and the false teachers who come, come in the, with an appearance of a sheep, but inside they are wolves. Because you can see only the appearance, you cannot see the inside of man. We cannot discern the heart or the soul of man. Only God knows the hearts of men. But we can discern man and understand him by his work and by his fruit. First of all, he has to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He has to have love, joy, peace. He has to have gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. And of course, we will first discern ourselves and then the rest. And then, this man must have uh, lips to testify the name of Jesus Christ. He must be light in the world. He must have good works too. Because faith without works is dead. 
And Apostle James persists and says, Show me your faith from your works, and I will show you my faith from my works. This is a combination that cannot be broken. And all these things begin only with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we say good fruit, we mean that uh, the fruit goes further into our surrounding environment, our family, our neighborhood. The Christian is a light. He, you are the light of the world, he says. I am the light of the world, Christ, and you are the light of the world. The Christian isn't a miserable person. He isn't a castaway. He isn't a reject. He is an intense personality. He is the most intense personality in this world. Because he is going up current along with Jesus Christ following him. Because he doesn't walk in his own understanding and logic, but he walks according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He does not walk according to his power and authority, but he goes forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God that saves those who believe in it. And he is not alone. Christ is with him. You know what it means for Christ to be with you, my beloved brethren. For him to defend you, to help you, to assist you and bless you. And all these things with one simple faith in the gospel of Christ. In the person of Jesus Christ. It's so easy. Whoever calls upon the name of Christ shall be saved. Is it so easy? It is. Do we not have to go and run and do this and that? None of these, th these things are required. Believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And you will be saved and your household. It's so simple. Mm, is it so simple though? Yes. But, Jesus Christ comes to reveal us the traps that a Christian may fall in. And these traps may lead him away from the way of truth, from the path of blessing. He says, be careful. He says this to the disciples, to the sincere people, that is. The ones who love the words of Christ, who care about everlasting life. He says, beware, beware of one thing, of hypocrisy, the leaven of the Pharisees. Be careful and learn that if you do something in the hidden place, don't think that no one will find out. There is nothing that is hidden, covered well, that will not be revealed. And there is nothing that is hidden... And it will not be known. Do not hope. I'll, I'll just say one little lie. No one will find out. They will find out. But the most important thing of all is not that other people will find out. The important thing is that Christ knows about it. And when we have hidden things, secret things in our heart with hypocrisy, we lose God's favor. And we always have to remember that there is no luck in the life of man. Luck, these things are human fiction. There is the favor of God. Whatever you may do, Christ says, I will prosper it. Whatever you may decide to do, I will bring it to pass. I will be with you. And if you do not want Christ to leave you and to be with you, first of all, be careful of lying, of hypocrisy. Be careful of that. You cannot hide in hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, lying, hiding, the I say other things and do other things, or think other things, these are the first things that push away God from your life. And for that reason, many people say, oh, that man, that man is very, has very bad luck. He doesn't have bad luck. He is probably a hypocrite. I don't know what else, but he is probably a liar. Or a hypocrite. These two things send away God's presence. These two things, hypocrisy and lying, send away God's help. So, what, but what does God say when he was looking for a man to use for his glory? I have found David of Jesse, a man according to my heart. He has a sincere heart. He has a clean heart. And Christ goes on to say, Blessed are the clean in heart, for they will see the face of God. If you want to see the face of God in your life, then your heart must be clean. This is what we must keep first of all. And he points it out. First of all, be careful. Beware of the leaven. Because if just a bit of leaven falls into a measure of, uh, into a lump, it will all become leavened. If you just keep a bit of lie inside you, then that will increase and increase and increase and you will become a hypocrite in the end. 
Beware of that small little lie, the little bit of hypocrisy, lest you lose God because of this. And my dear brethren, God combines hypocrisy with lying, with fear. I was afraid, that's why I didn't say, say so. I lied. Why did you lie? Because I was afraid. I hid it and didn't say anything. Why? Because I was afraid. Why were you afraid? And Christ comes and says, Don't worry. Don't be afraid, He says. Don't be afraid of the ones who can kill and do nothing else to your soul. They have no power. They can do nothing to you. The devil cannot do anything to you. He can't even touch you. No man can do anything to you. If, the scripture says, the gospel of Jesus Christ says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Who can be against us? If God is the one who justifies us, then who will condemn us? I lied because I was embarrassed. I was afraid. Who will condemn you, my brother? Tell the truth. Because the truth will set you free. Only the truth will set man free. Why does it set man free? Because Christ acts. When we are sincere and speak the truth without hesitating, then Christ comes and says to us, Don't worry, I will take care of this now. And how many of us haven't had this blessed experience and testimony that, I couldn't, I was afraid, I had to lie, but I said the truth, and God acted on my behalf. Let us remember always, my dear brethren, that the truth will set us free. Lie, the lie will bind us. And the lie will go further and further. It will expand. God's favor will be lost. God's grace will be lost. The mercy of God will be lost. We will lose it. So Christ says, I will show you whom you should fear. You must fear the one who has authority both to kill the body, but also to destroy the soul. The devil is powerful, but there is a one who is more strong, and that is Christ. The spirits of wickedness are powerful, but there is a spirit, the spirit of our Lord of hosts, that crushes and destroys all these. And Christ destroys the works of the devil. So it is in our interest for us to be with the word of God, because Christ will be with us. It is in our interest. And the absolute truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the rest, history, philosophy, theories, may have some, some specks or a lot of truth in it, but they have a lot of ven venom in them. It's like a glass with water with a drop of venom. If you drink both glasses, either a glass with one drop or with a full cup of venom, you will die. But the clear truth from the fountain of living waters, which is the word of God, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I will tell you whom you must fear. And be careful, this you must fear in the difficult situations. Difficult times will come when you will hesitate to speak the truth. But do not fear. Whoever testifies me, confesses me before his men. Whoever says, I belong to the Lord. I cannot lie because I believe in the gospel. Then... I will confess him before my Father and his holy angels. You know what it means for Christ to introduce you to God Almighty and to his angels? So within this whole spiritual, holy environment, Christ to in, introduce you to heaven saying, This is my Son, so we can understand this. Our intercessor in heaven, and paraclete in heaven, in favor of us all, is Christ. Our accuser in heaven of all our brethren is the devil. This is a reality. Either we believe it or not, this is a reality, the gospel truth. So the devil goes to God, who is righteous, and he accuses, and many times he accuses man justly. He lied. He did this sin. Is this your child? But when man testifies confesses his sins. He confesses sins to Christ. His sins, his mistakes. Then Christ goes and says, He is telling the truth that he is a sinner. But I have paid with my blood for, for his sins. And the Father says, He is innocent. Grace before God and men. So fear not. Jesus Christ is the one who always 
goes before us in our difficulty, in our mistakes, in our sins, in our problems. He will stand before us. He will get in front. And if Christ gets in front, then who can do anything? Who can do something against you? Let us continue in the Word of God, my brethren. Let us abide. doesn't matter if we make mistakes. It's not good for us to make mistakes. But even if we do make mistakes, we have a paraclete in heaven who is the remission of our sins. Christ prays for us. But also here on, not, on earth we are not alone. When Christ left, He said, Don't worry, I will send another paraclete, another comforter, the Spirit of truth. He will abide with you forever. And here on earth, the paraclete prays for us with moanings and groans that cannot be uttered in favor uh, for our sicknesses, for our difficulties. He prays for us. And you know what it means for the paraclete to pray for you to God the Father, God to God, for you? Hallelujah. Children feel great safety, safety when their father is with them. Even if someone bothers them, the father gets in front. Or when I was young, when we were young, whoever was lucky and he had an older brother, back then times were more difficult because we grew up in uh, neighborhoods. And whoever was lucky to have an older brother, no one would bother him. I'll tell my older brother, I'd tell them, and I remember this very, very well because I didn't have an older brother. Either older or younger than me, I could not speak because they had an older brother. But today we do have a big brother. Today I'm not without a big brother, and my big brother is Christ. Who can do anything to me? I say, Lord Jesus, look at this man. Look at what he's saying. It's so simple. He's accusing me. What do you say? He's creating problems for me. And I pray and say, but forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. Well, from then on, everything opens. New paths open. New ways. The heavens open. Man becomes a citizen of heaven. Christ says, I am your defender. And for that reason, therefore, when they bring you into synagogues and before magistrates and authorities to confess, don't worry about what or how you should say. Don't worry at all. Do not be anxious. You are not alone. At that hour, you won't be the one speaking, but the paraclete, the comforter that is dwelling inside you, will speak through your mouth. At that moment, the comforter will teach you what you ought to say. The Christian is an absolute security. And as weird as this might seem, it is an event. It is the truth. It's a fact. It isn't difficult for Christ to defend you. It isn't difficult for Christ to protect you, to keep you, to bless you. The difficult thing is something else. The difficult thing is for you to believe it. The difficult thing is for you to believe that Jesus Christ is next to you. Draw near to God, the Word of God says, and then He will draw near to you. Is He always with you? Always. But when you draw near to God. And how do we draw near to God? Through His Word. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. And then God the Father is next to us. Jesus Christ is next to us. And the Holy Spirit is next to us. One God. A unique God. The only glorious God. We thank God. But there is also a different, another problem that may create problems and dangers in the life of the disciples. And Christ must teach us about this. The first is hypocrisy. A very serious problem. And fear. And these two things are combined. But the second, which is very serious, is covetousness. So at that moment, as they were listening to the words of God, some man, it doesn't say if he was a disciple or not, some man cried out from the crowd. And he said, Teacher, you who are righteous, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Listen to what he's hearing and what he has in his heart. This is the crucial point. What do you hear and what do you have in your heart? What do you hear and what do you have in your heart? What do you have in your heart? Do you have anxiety? We'll see about anxiety. Do you have cares? Do you have fear? Do you have injustice? Do you feel wronged? Do you feel like wronging someone? What do we have in our heart? Because from the abundance of our heart, the mouth will speak. And while this man was listening to all these beautiful words that we hear today from the lips of Jesus Christ Himself, 
what he had in his heart came out. He said, you are just, you are good, and you are righteous. So help me now. What kind of a petition is this? Help me now, so my brother can divide the inheritance of my father with me. Who knows what problems these two people had? And the, the brother had the authority not to share the inheritance. He was probably the firstborn. The firstborns took everything. We don't know. But he felt so wronged. He felt so wronged. Don't claim your righteousness or justice. One of the great mistakes is for us to claim our righteousness before men and God. Jesus Christ taught us otherwise. When they were approaching him and swearing at him and afflicting him wrongly because he was sinless, the word of God says, said that he gave himself up not to men, but to God who judges righteously. But no one could see him. No one could see him, but God never sees from existing. He gave himself up, up to his father. He said, Father, look at what they're doing to me. And the scripture says, the nice mindset of Christ. This is the mindset that you ought to have. The same with Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he became um, of no reputation, emptied himself from the glory of God, became man, took the form of a bondservant, and as man, he humbled himself to the point of death, death of the cross even. And it doesn't end there. That is where it begins. So for that reason, the Father gave him the name above all names. That's why God exalted him. And before him every knee shall bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will testify that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Why? Not because he is the Son of God, and because he was born by the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin. Not because of this. Not because he performed miracles. Not because he spoke the truth. Not because he was the one who he was, the great teacher, the healer, the savior, the redeemer. Not because of that. The Father, His Father, God Almighty, exalted Him because He humbled Himself to the point of death, death of the cross. Because it is written, and let us remember, that the Scripture cannot be cancelled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. The Scripture cannot be cancelled. Are you puffed up? Do you exalt yourself? Do you present yourself as someone great and important? You will be humbled. God knows how to humble the proud. God knows. But do you become like Christ? Are you obedient to God? Do you humble yourself before God and men? Do you give yourself up to the one who judges righteously? Then we come to what we began with. Do you not claim your righteousness, but you let God, Christ, take care of your righteousness, then God will make sure you are exalted. Is there a chance that He won't exalt you? No chance at all. Is there a chance for us to take a cork, plunge it into the sea, and not and it not to float? There's no chance. Why? Because there's this natural law, the law that makes this. And we cannot doubt it. If you put a cork in the water, it will come to the surface by chance. No, it will happen. Because there is this physical law. If there is, therefore, this physical law, won't there be a spiritual law that says God resists the proud and gives, hum gives grace to the humble? Search, find, seek out. When you are proud, you fall. Examine it. When you humble yourselves, you are exalted. Just look around you. Whomever you see as humble, in the end, God will exalt this man. Whoever pretends to be clever, and he knows how to do things, and he is an important and great, and he despises and is ironic, this man will fall. It's impossible. It's a law. From the abundance of the heart, therefore, the mouth speaks. This man had pride in his heart. He had covetousness. And these two things go together. Why should he have the money and not I? I want more. Why isn't he sharing the money with me? Would you share the money with him? But what does the humble man say? What do you want, Lord? How nice was Abraham with Lot. Remember him? 
their shepherds fought and quarreled. And Abraham went to Lot and told him, We cannot, we're, we're brethren, we cannot fight, it's not good. Here is the land, all before you stretched out. Choose. He has a beautiful spirit. But this is in his faith here. Choose. If you go that way, I will go this way. Whatever you take, good. Whatever you leave, I will take. This is so nice. Whatever you leave for me, I will take. You go to the left, I will go to the right. You go north, I will go south. And the cunning heart of Lot now. He looked all around. He wanted the best place. And there he saw in Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, valleys, waters, a wealthy, rich land. So he had covetousness. He says, I want this part. Well, here, have it. And what was that for Abraham? The wilderness. And someone would say, oh, poor Abraham. He was a fool, wasn't he? But when he left, God drew near to him and told him, come here, I want to tell you something. Look to the north. He looked north. Look to the south now. Look toward the east. Look toward the west. Do you see all these things? All these things are yours. Lord my God. But it was the wilderness was left for me. The wilderness is from men. But the, but the heavens are from me. The blessing will come from me. The difficult thing, I repeat, is not for God to bless us. The difficult thing is for us to believe it. Lot chose by sight. Abraham went on in faith. You know what happened to Lot in the end? <laughs> Let me not get into that. You know that story. Let us not continue. A war took place. He was captured. And all the ones who were in that rich territory, Abraham found out. He said, oh, well, I won't leave my brother there. But he wronged you. He didn't wrong me. He may have said that, but God blessed me. And then... Then the nice things will be in. So he took an army, went and set him free. And along with Lot, he set free all the Gentiles. So the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah came and told them, Here, here, have some money. You set us free. He said, No, I'm not going to take anything from you. Then you'll say that you made me rich. Whatever I have, I have from the Lord. Now, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. I don't want anything from men. I want good gifts, perfect gifts from my heavenly Father. So they lost it. What? You don't want a reward? You don't want us to give you a treasure, something, a gift? So can't we thank you this way? No, I don't. And then he left. And he didn't take anything from them. Oh, he was a fool. He wasn't a fool. Because as soon as he left, the Lord approached him and told him, Abraham, I'm your defender. You lost the gifts. He lost the gifts of Sodom, of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. But he won over the gifts of God. The defense of God. Is it worth it, my brethren? I repeat it. Because this is the message also. It isn't difficult for God to bless you. The difficult thing is for you to believe it. It isn't difficult for God to do great wonders in your life. The difficult thing is for you to believe it and to go on in your life being wronged, giving yourself up to the one who judges righteously. Lord, make my brother divide the inheritance with me. And the Lord said, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you to divide your wealth? What do you think that I am? Give me an apartment building, Lord. What am I here? Do you think I'm here for apartment buildings? Don't you see that man? He's wronging me. Throw a lightning bolt on his head. He's swearing at me. He reproaches me. He steals me. Go, deal with him. Send a lightning bolt on his head. Am I here for lightning bolts, my child? I'm here for blessing. Tell me to bless and I will bless someone. I did not come to judge man, but to save him. I did not come to afflict people, but to bless them. You do not know of what spirit you are. But be careful now. He turns to the one that he spoke in the beginning, who spoke to Christ. Be careful. Beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Your life is in the hands of Christ. In every detail, your life depends on God. In your business, uh, in your family stuff, in your health, uh, in your spiritual, 
everything. You will not be more important, greater, or happier if you have more deposits in the bank. Blessing will come in your life if you are close to God. If God is with you, then you are blessed. Don't worry if someone wrongs you. God will justify you. Don't worry if people swear at you. God will bless you. And you must love people. Love them, everyone. Let me explain to you what happens to the covetous man. There was once a certain rich man who became more wealthy because he, his crop, his ground yielded plentifully. Everything grew and increased. And he said within himself, What should I do now? Now I have a lot. My barns are small. I know what I will do, he said. I will pull down my barns and build greater ones, and I will put in there all my crops and my belongings. Listen to this. Ma, I will do this. I will pull down the barns, my barns, build greater barns, my crops, my goods. Everything is his. Nothing is his. Nothing is ours, my brethren. What is yours? My house. Where did you get your house? From my father. So it's your father's house. It's not yours. And soon when you will die, to whom will it belong? To your son. So nothing is ours, my brethren. Nothing at all. God has lended it to us so we can manage it. We have nothing on our own. Neither our health, neither our stature, neither our beauty. Look at that man. He's tall. He's 30 years old and he's tall. But at 80, if he's alive, then you'll see how tall he is. And what are 50 years? They pass this way. I'm 60 years old now and I haven't realized it yet. And I was tall and beautiful. But as years go by, the years go by. Of course, I wasn't tall, okay? I'm making a joke now. But nothing is ours, my brethren. Nothing at all. You know how clever that man is. He is a professor in the university. But now, he's forgetting. And I'm forgetting. I'm starting to forget also. He forgets. And all the things that he's learned, he is forgetting. Years go by. And if God brings a thorn in the side, the back, or the kidney, or the heart doesn't beat well, or some uh, pressure, then you get anxious. You have many deposits in the bank, but what can you do with this money? What should you do with the deposits? My dear brethren, what matters is Christ. Our life with Christ. Amen, my brethren? Our life with Jesus Christ. Do you believe this? Lord, make it easy so we can believe this. What does do you believe it mean? Do you trust Christ? Can you trust His Word and say, What it says in here, I will do, Lord. Many times it's strange. But how are you telling me to do this now, Lord? Love your enemies. What are you saying? Pray for them. What is this that you're saying? And now, so Christ can explain it to us, because He doesn't tell us things that, so we cannot understand. He says, If you love those who love you, and you pray for the ones who pray for you, then what grace does God owe you? Sinners do the same thing. Card players love card players. Harlots love harlots. Fornicators keep company with fornicators. But if you love your enemies, then God owes you grace. You earn the grace of God when you do the will of God, even if it seems a bit irrational to you. Besides, we are not speaking about human wisdom here, which is sensual and demonic. We are talking about the heavenly wisdom. The, he the wisdom of God. And now the Word of God comes to tell us something, my brethren, that is very important. Who is the man who is so wise, who has the solution to all things? Who knows the solution to every problem? Is there such a man? In every problem that he faces, he knows the solution. And not only does he know the solution, but he also lives the solution. Does, is there such a man? How can you find such a man? There's no such man. Man doesn't know the future. He doesn't know when, how. He doesn't know anything. But there is such a man. Who is it? The one who has Christ with him. Because the, Christ goes before him. Lord, what should I do here? You won't do anything. I will do. I'll take care of it. Can Christ do it? What do you think? Can he? Is there anything impossible with God? 
It isn't difficult for God. It is difficult for us to believe it, for us to trust His Word, for us to trust, trust our life in Him, our soul. Now a problem comes. It is great. What should I do now? Okay, you're, what you're saying is good and nice. Yeah, but I'm ablaze now. I'm on fire. Yeah, you're on fire. But what? Do you think I have never been on fire in my life? But I don't look for fire extinguishers. The scripture says, Do not be anxious for anything. But may all your requests, take, take all your requests, go into your room, close the door, there your heavenly Father is waiting for you in the secret place, with thanksgiving, through supplication and prayer, share your problem with Him, unload your burden, every burden, cast every burden, and sin that entangles us so easily, at the feet of Christ, and He will take care of everything. And the first thing that will come into your life will be the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. Anxiety and worries will leave. The peace of God will come. Why? Because God will take care of it. You told me to go and take care, to bring it to you, Lord. Now you will take care of it. This isn't my problem now. This is your problem. And God says, okay, it's my problem. And not only do I accept this, He says, but He says, come, come, I will receive you. The one who comes toward me, I will not cast out, Jesus says. So when you open the door and you enter your room and you lock it behind you, then you go to God. Why? Because the gospel says so. He will not cast you out, but what will he say? He will do. He will answer. He will take care of your problem. And when you will walk out of that room, you will leave the problem inside and you will come out free. But the rich man in this parable, what should I do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I will pull down my barns and build greater ones. Nice thought. It isn't irrational, humanly thinking. But he has forgotten something that is very important. He has forgotten the future. What follows what he is seeing. What is coming after. And after he destroyed them, built greater ones, and filled them with his goods and crops, then he said, Oh, my soul, now, now eat as if the soul can eat. Eat, drink, be merry, and take your ease because you have La goods laid up for many years but God comes and says fool this is what he hadn't taken into consideration God fool this night and it is terrible your demon the demons require your soul tonight you did not give me your soul you did not give me your life you did not care about me so today, the demons are coming and telling me, this man is not, does not care about you, so he's ours. And I do not have words, so I can resist their request. And anyway, the thing, you are leaving this earth now, but the things you have prepared, for whom will they be? Foolish man. You know, my dear brethren, we spoke about faith. But speaking about lack of faith, we have to combine it with foolishness. An unbeliever is a foolish man. He is a fool. There is no God, the fool said in his heart. There is no God. And because you say in your heart that there is no God, there isn't a God. Is that what you think? There is a God. Either we want it or not. And we are happy that there is a God. Because this God became our Father. Because we received Christ. He isn't a God who is far away. Whoever has received Jesus Christ, the gospel says, to them God gave the authority to be children of God. It is an authority for you to be a child of God. A heavenly authority. What does authority mean? It is very simple. Through our life, God speaks to us so we can understand everything. Your child in your home has authority, but he has no authority in my house. My child has authority in my house. When I was young, I had authority in my father's house. I told him, Father, I don't have shoes. And we didn't have many pairs of shoes back then. One, and that was the most. Father, I don't have shoes, I'd tell him. He'd think about it. He'd bring out his finances and say, Okay, I'll buy you some. I want to go to the teacher so he can help me in uh, math. My child, can't you succeed on your own? No. So he was looking for a tutor, and he paid the tutor. Whatever I needed, for, I went to my father. Because I knew that He loved me. Does our Father love us, my dear brethren? Our Heavenly Father? Does He love you, my brother? He does love you. He says, If you who are evil know how to give good 
portions to your children, then how much more will my Heavenly Father not give good portions to you? The difficult thing isn't for God to give us. The difficult thing is for us to believe us. Do we believe it? And so now our Lord comes to give us the answer. Be careful. If man has many, his life... So for that reason, learn to lay up treasure not for yourself, to have many, a lot, but learn to lay, be rich toward God. Learn that whatever you do, whatever you desire, must be in the presence of God. Not in your personal life. I want to have a lot of money so I can do anything I like. You won't do anything in your life. I will have Christ with me. Then He will do anything you like in your life. And your life will go on from blessing to blessing, from grace to grace, and glory to glory. And ending here, whoever calls upon the name of Christ shall be saved with faith. So today, all together, we call upon the name of Christ. We ask for His grace, His mercy, His blessing, His glory, everlasting life. Amen.